The six o'clock news starts right now. Accused of fleeing the scene of an alcohol fueled head on crash in November. San Antonio City Councilman Clayton Perry now seems to be doing his best to flee scrutiny. Perry returned to City Council today after nearly a two month leave of absence. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger live downtown. Garrett, I know you tried to get a one on one with the councilman that didn't work. Do you think he was ready for the hard questions he faced today? Honestly, I'm not sure what he was expecting. His choice to return is a somewhat puzzling one. When he went on his leave of absence nearly two months ago, he was only facing one charge, failure to stop and give information. But he's since been hit with a DWI charge, which brought with it more details about how much police say he had to drink before the crash. 14 drinks in four hours, according to them. And today, Perry at best only tangentially referenced his situation. Now he delivered a short set of prepared remarks when he returned to council today, which were even shorter on specifics. Perry said he had followed the quote appropriate measures recommended by medical experts during his leave and that he was 100% devoted to quote this never happening again. He also said he was thankful that other people involved weren't physically harmed, but he never said exactly why he was returning with the two charges still hanging over him. Well, it's in my statement. No, sir, it's it's not okay. though. You don't want to give an explanation on why you why you decided to come back. Do you really think that short statement was enough for for your constituents? A lot of people have questions. Is there anything Thank that you, you want to say to them? In all, Perry ducked questions from us and other reporters three separate times today before skipping an afternoon briefing, which his chief of staff said was in order for Perry to handle a personal matter. Now, about the only thing we did get from Councilman Perry today was an indicate was a response to what he plans to do when the May 6th election comes around. His seat is going to be on the ballot right now. Perry says he has not made a decision whether or not he will seek reelection. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Some questions still need to be answered, though. I agree with you, Garrett. Thank you. Well, tomorrow night, the San Antonio Spurs return to their former home floor for their 50th anniversary. A record-breaking crowd will be turning out to see the silver and black face off against the NBA champs, the Golden State Warriors. And with big crowds, there will be major traffic and the problems that go with that. Cabello Juarez with what fans can expect as they return to the Dome. And if you're going why you're going to want to plan ahead. For longtime Spurs fans, the Alamo Dome is nostalgic. It's home to their first championship in 1999. It's going to be markedly different than what they remember when they were at the Spurs games back in the late 90s. Richard Oliver with the San Antonio Sports Facilities says the Dome is a great place to celebrate 50 years of the Spurs being in San Antonio. This is a stadium. This is like going to a concert and then being kind of up high, watching the guy down on the stage. Parking lots will open around 11.30 a.m. Doors to the Alamo Dome open at 4.30 and tip-off is at 6.30. The halftime game performance is by 90s rap duo Tag Team. The game is set to bring record-breaking crowds, more than 60,000 people. And Oliver says the Alamo Dome staff is ready. What we're trying to do is make sure we have as many people as we need in all the different areas, uh, ticket takers, uh, concessions, uh, security, everything. Ticket holders will have access to the pre and post game parties at the HEB Plaza. Food, drinks and merchandise and a fireworks show will light up the sky at 10. Afterwards, you get to party together and just come together in a fellowship kind of and celebrate the Spurs 50 years. There will, there will be parking downtown and around the stadium, but Spurs fans can also park at the AT&T Center and take a VIA bus to the Alamo Dome. But as usual, you're going to want to try and get out here early. There's going to be rush hour traffic as well as road closures and construction sprinkled throughout downtown. We have all the information you're going to need about tomorrow's game on our website. Reporting live from the Alamo Dome, Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Camellia. And as you said, we have all the information you need to know if you're going to the game. Just scan this code. It's going to take you to KSAT.com for all the important information from when you can start showing up at the dome to where to go if you want to use Via's park and ride. To other news now, one man dead killed in a crash while trying to get away from Bear County deputies. Sheriff Javier Salazar telling Alyssa Cole 
It all started when deputies made a traffic stop. This is the scene left behind after a man crashed into a utility pole and hit a parked tow truck near West Military in Marbach. It happened around one this morning after a Bear County Sheriff deputy pulled the driver over. During the initial traffic stop, the deputy spotted what he believed to be narcotics inside the car. Uh, the driver willingly handed him uh, what, what we believe to be prescription medication, Xanax, something like that, in a baggie. Uh, that looked like it was packaged for, for commercial distribution. But then the man inside the vehicle indicated to the deputy that he had a handgun. So the deputy at that point verbally asked the suspect to step out of the vehicle. Uh, the suspect just said no and then drove away at a high rate of speed. The sheriff says the deputy did not have a chance to chase the driver, but when he went looking for him, he stumbled upon the crash scene. The man was ejected out of the vehicle and died. Investigators found drugs and a weapon. But we did find a felony amount of, of drugs in the car and at least a, a, a one handgun underneath the suspect. Um, we did find various uh, different different calibers of ammunition. Police found Xanax and marijuana inside the vehicle and they say it appeared sealed in package ready for sale. No one else was injured in this incident. Police are working to identify the man. Alyssa Cole, Case at 12 News. A 24 year old man taken away in handcuffs after police say he tried to hit someone with his car. Officers tell us that suspect got into a fight with someone while he was parked in the 400 block of Perrin Central. Police said the suspect then tried to hit that person with his vehicle. However, he ended up hitting the business instead. Officers tell us he crashed into the side of this convenience store. No one hurt. Police arrested the driver. He was booked on DWI to start. New Braunfels police releasing more details about an ATM robbery that happened back on January 2nd. Police say the suspect assaulted an ATM technician at the Randolph Brooks Federal Credit Union on Highway 46 before grabbing a drawer of money and jumping into a maroon Dodge Charger with a getaway driver. Now, investigators say he was wearing a black hoodie, gloves and pants that showed his multicolored underwear. Anyone with any information about the suspect, the getaway driver or the location of the Dodge Charger asked to call New Braunfels Police or the Comal County Crime Stoppers at 830-620-TIPS. The price of eggs continues to soar and that has some businesses scrambling like Mimo's Bakery and Cafe. They go through more than 200 dozen a week because just about everything they make, omelets, bread, cookies, cakes, requires eggs. But the owner tells us that a case that used to call her cost her $22, now $98. We've been trying to put it off raising prices because, I mean, who wants to pay $20 for an omelet? You know, I mean, it just seems ridiculous. But when you add all that egg cost in there, it's like it's a lot. Why are eggs so high? Well, there are a number of reasons like feed and fuel costs, but avian flu is also a big culprit because it's wiped out millions of chickens. Economists say prices will likely continue to rise this spring and come down later in the year. And checking out Trans Guide at this hour, we are at I-35 and Ritterman. It's the southbound lanes where there's a problem. You can see there's an accident out there. They're attempting to get it cleared up. It looks like at least one, maybe two lanes blocked right now. Well, after having to go virtual last year during COVID, Monday's Martin Luther King Jr. March will be back in person, probably by hundreds of thousands of people, yet only about 700 expected at a Dream Week event this Saturday that will also honor the civil rights leader in its own way. Jesse DeGoriato tonight tells us how and why the Freedom Walk started last year. Virtually honoring Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't enough for those who took part in the first Freedom Walk last year. I wanted to do something live and in person uh, with people who had a mind to do so. Bishop Charles Flowers leads San Antonio Black, White and Brown, the nonprofit that organized the walk. He says it also seemed to him the MLK march had become too political and leaning to the left. I've seen that it has taken on those kind of characteristics. But Dwayne Robinson, who chairs the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, told us, quote, everyone has their opinion. The size of our march speaks for itself and it is growing, end quote. Those who want to keep doing what they were doing, they're free to do it. Flowers says along the same two mile route as the march, the Freedom Walk this year will reenact civil rights milestones. At Lincoln Park, the Emancipation Proclamation. At Second Baptist Church, the churches who spoke out during the struggle for civil rights, often with deadly consequences. 
The bloody Sunday confrontation on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma will be remembered on the Commerce Street Bridge, concluding at MLK Park with words of inspiration by religious leaders. Our intention is just to, to refocus on the life and on the message of Dr. King. Jesse DeGuyado, KSAT 12 News. Check out live cam right now. And you know, when all that wind was kicking up last night, all I kept thinking is, here comes the cedar. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Last week, pretty much every single day, we at least had those high to even very high mountain cedar levels. Once again today, that has been the case. Thanks to those gusty north winds that flipped on after the cold front came through. Those winds are starting to die down. That'll be the theme even more so this evening and tonight. Temperature is pleasant out there. We're at 60 degrees officially here this hour in San Antonio, a dew point of 27. So those humidity levels have also dropped that combined with those calming winds and clear skies through the overnight, helping those temperatures tumble. It will be a cold start to our Friday morning. We're waking up to the upper 30s here in Bear County, close to freezing in spots across the hill country and then temperatures in the afternoon pretty seasonable. But as we head into the weekend and next week, those temperatures will start to warm above average at times. We'll tell you when we're expecting all of that and get you an early look at that weekend forecast after the break. A neighborhood shaken up by a deadly crash tonight on the night beat. What police say happened before a woman was hit and killed in the street and the concerns neighbors are now raising. So, so no comment. It's OK that you had yeah. a 67. See, so OK. A score of 67 and a second appearance on behind the kitchen door. The violations the health inspector found inside the San Antonio restaurant and what they had to say about it tonight on the night beat. Well, new at six, if you're a regular gym goer, you might be seeing a lot of new people strengthened with the resolve of a New Year's resolution. You can find a lot of studies touting the benefits of regular exercise. So what's holding Americans back when it comes to getting active? Ursula Perry has a look at some of the worst exercise myths. Exercise can boost energy, promote weight loss, improve your sleep, and lessen your risk for a slew of health conditions. But there are a lot of myths about physical activity that could prevent you from reaping the full benefits. The first fallacy, lifting weights will cause women to bulk up. Truth is, women have lower levels of testosterone, so they won't build massive muscles. Another myth, you can reduce fat in a specific area. Well, you can't control what part of your body burns fat. Also, if you've been told to stick to one type of activity, you've been misinformed. That's because your body gets used to it. Switch it up. If you're running all the time, take a break and do Pilates and then go back to it. Another myth, running is bad for your knees. Northwestern Medicine says that regular running strengthens your joints and protects against osteoarthritis. Also, you might have heard that you need to stretch before a workout, but this is also untrue. It's more effective to stretch after a workout when your muscles are warm. Also, the notion that exercise will offset a bad diet is also false. Diet and nutrition typically plays a larger role than exercise when it comes to weight management. And if you've been told results from exercise come quickly, uh, think again. When you're involved in the gym, you're probably looking at four to six weeks before you should honestly begin to start to see some changes. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Sky 12 out and about on this Thursday over downtown. The Torch of Friendship statue that you see right there. And Mia, I'm guessing Cedar went up today, I'm guessing it's going to explode tomorrow. Well, right, because we've seen those winds kick on after that cool front moved through last night. So, yes, that kind of helps some of that pollen that's in the hill country filter into our neck of the woods. So, yes, mountain cedar high again today. It is possible and frankly likely that we see elevated levels yet again into our Friday. So, unfortunately, just something that we're going to have to deal with here over the next couple of days. It 
is most definitely mountain cedar season here in South Central Texas. All right, besides the cedar count and besides those gusty winds out there today, overall it wasn't a bad day out there. We had temperatures top off in the 60s across a good portion of the area today, closer to where we should be for this time of year. Those winds are going to subside as we head into the overnight hours tonight, meaning temperatures are going to fall pretty efficiently by wake up time tomorrow morning. We're in the 30s here in San Antonio, and that's going to be the story yet again into early Saturday, but then plenty of sunshine is expected, leading to again somewhat seasonable afternoons into Sunday, though those temperatures are going to start to warm. We'll see some of the humidity return. It also is going to be breezy yet again for the back half of the weekend's plans and then into next week, especially the first half of next week, warmer than average temperatures move back into the forecast and unfortunately only very limited rain chances. But let's talk about that limited rain chance again. We are dry out there here this Thursday evening. It was a dry front that we found move through overnight last night, not expecting any rain in and out of the upcoming weekend and at least into the first half of next week. As of right now, we've got a 10, maybe 20% chance for a few isolated showers next Wednesday. That is all going to be thanks to an area of low pressure over the desert southwest. That's going to track eastward throughout the first half of next week. By Wednesday morning, we start to see a weak cool front move into the area. An isolated shot for a stray shower here in San Antonio. Slightly better chances across our eastern counties, much like the past couple of fronts that we've seen move through. But again, don't have a lot of high hopes right now. We'll see where the data takes us over the next several days. 2022 second driest year on record, and you can definitely see that be reflected in the latest drought monitor that was released earlier this morning. We still have exceptional drought in place. Northern Bear County stretching up to Comal, Kendall County, even portions of Kerr, Medina and Bandera counties. A lot of drought still in place across our southern, western and even far eastern counties. So yes, we definitely could use the rain. We'll see what we can find over the next seven days and even more so as we look ahead to the back half of January. But until then, yes, we are dry out there right now. Winds are starting to calm down. Earlier this morning, we saw some wind gusts upwards of about 30 to 35 miles per hour. Those winds will continue to subside overnight. So combine that with the lower humidity values in place, clear skies. It's going to be a chilly start tomorrow morning. Right now, temperature is in the 50s. A few low 60s still here in Bear County, 59 in Bolverde, 60 over at the airport, 63 in Casherville, 58 up in Bandera. We'll start off tomorrow morning in the upper 30s here in San Antonio. Some low 30s possible in the hill country for places like Kerrville and Comfort. Definitely going to want to bundle up stepping out for the morning drive. Plenty of sunshine, though, is in store throughout the day tomorrow. It will be a beautiful into the work week. We're near 57 by 11 a.m. Forecast highs in the mid 60s for the most part for your Friday afternoon. Yet another cold start. Saturday yet again upper 30s for those morning lows here in town mostly sunny skies temperatures in the upper 60s into Sunday though there's that warming trend that then moves in morning lows in the upper 40s how about afternoon highs in the mid 70s really into the beginning of next week? We will continue to see that warming trend take place as slightly more humidity works back into the picture. Highs are near 80 by Tuesday and then see if that's when we'll monitor for that next front to move in by midweek. All right, I know we deal with cedar. That's just something you get in South Texas, but it's hard to complain about these temperatures, right? It's going to be pretty nice closer to where we should be for this time of year. All right, thanks, Mia. All right, so when we last checked in, the San Antonio Spurs knew they were going to set a record for the game tomorrow. What 63,000 some tickets that were sold. Yeah, they're, they're selling even more than that right now. Yeah, they're close to 64,500. So there's some 2000 above the old NBA record for a regular season attendance in a single game. That is pretty awesome. Coming up, Warrior Steph Curry has played in a dome before, so he shares his thoughts and in the NFL. Trayvon Diggs has had some success against Tom Brady, but can the Cowboys stop the GOAT? Coming up.
Memphis Grizzlies had to hang on to beat the Spurs 135 to 129 last night to sweep the two-game series at the FedEx Forum. Led by John Morant in his game-high 38 points, the Grizzlies led by as many as 19 in the third quarter, only to watch the Spurs scrap back to get within four with less than 45 seconds left in regulation, but Memphis held on for its eighth straight win. After missing two straight games with left hamstring tightness, Keldon Johnson returned to action, and he led the Spurs with 24 points. Trey Jones had a 22. Jakob Pertl had a double-double with 17 points and 12 rebounds. The young Spurs are playing better, but still, they need to get over that hump that's holding them back. We're young. We're still learning. Uh, we still have a lot of guys that are um, in the early stages of their career, so they're learning how to close out games. And I think uh, we're starting to see the importance of, you know, every possession matters. You know, even if it's the first quarter, if we turn it over and they get a dunk on the other end, it's going to come um, back to bite us at the end. Spurs will host the Warriors tomorrow night. The Alamo Dome in the NBA's biggest game of the regular season, and I'm not kidding. So Golden State is currently holding practice at the Dome, but media hasn't been allowed in yet to shoot it. Now, some of the Warriors have likely never played inside a Dome, so this gives them a chance to get used to the Alamo Dome sight lines and the court itself. This morning, the Spurs announced they have released additional tickets for the game and said 64,387 tickets have been sold. The additional tickets are comprised of standing room only on the floor, single seats, and seating with limited views. They're all set to break the all-time attendance record for a single game. Now, Tuesday night after losing to the Suns, Steph Curry was asked about playing inside the Alamo Dome. It'll be very unique. It'll be cool to be a part of hopefully a record setting night. Um, I've never been to the Alamo Dome. I have played in the Dome before in uh, at Ford Field in Detroit during our, our tournament run back in 08. And it's a, it's a wild experience when the court's in the middle of the floor. The sight lines are a little different. Your depth perception is a little different. Steph returned Tuesday night from an 11 game absence from a partially dislocated left shoulder and scored 24 points in the Warriors 125 113 loss of the Suns. The Warriors and Spurs are both riding three game losing streaks. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. When the Buccaneers host the Cowboys during Super Wild Card Weekend, they'll be two and a half point underdogs at Raymond James Stadium, even with seven time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady leading the Bucs offensive attack. So the boys are an up and down team this season, but they've shown signs of being a top five scoring offense and defense, but rarely at the same time. Overall, the Bucs have been less impressive compared to Dallas, but they have Brady and his championship experience. In two games against Brady, Cowboys cornerback Trayvon Diggs has one interceptions and four passes defense. So that pick came in the boys week one loss to Tampa in the 2021 season. Now Diggs was asked how helpful is watching the tape from that game. I think it's helpful, you know, but I didn't know I'm gonna play my game, you know, uh, make him react off me. So, you know, just doing my job, you know, doing what I need to do to, you know, help the team win. Dallas is four and five as playoff favorite since 1996. Kick is Monday night, 7:15 here on KSAT 12. Congratulations to UTSA outside linebacker Trey Moore, who was named the 2022 Football Writers Association of America Freshman All-America team. The Smithson Valley alum totaled 59 tackles, 18 of those for loss, eight sacks, six pass breakups, five QB hurries, two forced fumbles, and a fumble recovery. I'm running out of breath naming all of his stats. That's impressive. Yeah, by the way, you, the Warriors don't have to look far to find somebody who's played in the Alamo Dome. Exactly. Head coach Steve Kerr. Just got to ask him. Just ask Kerr. Yeah. <laughs> Former Congressman Will Hurd is our guest on the Q&A. He's in the studio. We're going to talk to him next about bipartisanship and more. Bipartisan seems to be a rarity in Washington, D.C. Some people say it's a dirty word. My guest on KSAT Q&A today is not one of those. Will Hurd is a former U.S. representative for District 23, of course, former CIA officer, cybersecurity executive, author of the book American Reboot. You can read about him at willbeheard.com, but a lot of people, of course, are very familiar with you. Congressman, thank you for joining us. I want to talk off the top about this idea of bipartisanship. Sure. Uh, we just saw you know, a heated debate just among Republicans to, to pick a new Speaker of the House. Is it 
possible to be bipartisan? It absolutely is possible, and that's what actually what the country wants. If you look at the results of the midterm elections in, in November in 2022, uh, the message was, hey, we want serious people solving serious problems. There's always this debate in politics that ticket splitters don't exist. People that vote for one party for something like governor and a different party for, let's say, a, 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 a U.S. House representative member. Um, there's a lot of those showed up uh, in this past election. And if, if both parties recognize and, and a answer a simple question, what do we want America to be? And nobody in America is going to say, we want America to be a place that breaks down into red enclaves and blue enclaves. It's a place that we want um, where anybody, if they set their mind to it, can become whoever they want to be. That's the America we want. And if you focus on that, then you're going to realize the only way to do it is together. Are we at the point where border solutions, where you think there is a bipartisan border solution out there? Because to me, it seems to break down with whoever the president is yeah. gets blamed for problems at the border. But there aren't a lot of solutions mm -hmm. on what should happen at the border. So, so the reality is you can get 240 votes in the House, you can get 60 votes in the Senate, but what prevents a solution from actually coming to the floor for a vote are leadership of both parties, because both parties would rather use this issue as a political bludgeon than to, to solve the problem. And that's, that's really unfortunate. And I know this exists because when I was in Congress, I worked with a guy, Pete Aguilar, a Democrat from California, on a piece of legislation that addressed DACA, that addressed the root causes in other places, that talked about putting technology along the border and fixing this really broken uh, legal system that is, is backed up with millions of people. So the, so, the, 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 so the actual solutions are not hard, but getting leadership willing to, to um, on, on Republican and Democrats to not be afraid of their fringe and solve a real problem, it's possible. Um, whether the political will is there to do that right now, um, that's the real question, I don't think it is. I was gonna say, are we getting closer though? I don't think we are. L let's take something as simple as streamlining legal immigration. Right. Um, one of the things that President Biden is talking about is if you apply for asylum in your own home country, we're gonna streamline the process. That could get done for, for, worker v for, for, for the, the guest worker program. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, there are some on the far left that don't wanna see that kind of thing from, from happening. Uh, there are people on the, on the, the, the left that wanna see uh, more technology be placed along the board Order, but there are too many Republicans that don't want to work with Democrats and seen as if they're soft on this issue. So it's unfortunate. It just seems like we're spending so much money on the border with military solutions mm -hmm. and, like you said, technology solutions when things could be made easier that maybe is at least part of the solution, if not the solution. Look, how you name the industry, it's right here in San Antonio. How long do you have to wait in line for certain things? It's because yeah. there's a lot of companies and a lot of industries that still need workers. And, and even though we're at this tough time with inflation and potentially going to a recession, there's still a lot of industries that need workers. So let's streamline legal immigration. And, and unfortunately, the other problem that people have is not understanding what asylum is. There are literally folks on the on the, on the far left that believe that anybody should be able to come to the United States. And that's not what asylum is. And, and, just be, and, and it's not humane to give an excuse for human smugglers to take the money and, and life savings of people to go on this perilous journey. It's hard to get from, from Guatemala City to Eagle Pass, right? And that's not humane by allowing that environment for those kinds of things to happen. And so it's an unfortunate situation. And as you know, and you all follow, our communities along the border have been dealing with this, not just in this administration, but the last administration, and they are pushed to the extreme, and they can't b bear the brunt of this problem, of this crisis, um, much longer. All right, I want to talk quickly and lean on your uh, CIA expertise. Mm -hmm. When we talk about classified documents, obviously there are some major differences between the documents that President Trump had and the mm -hmm. documents that President Biden has. But when we talk about classified documents, how concerned are you as a former CIA agent that these classified documents are leaving places they should not be leaving. Well, that, that's what I thought. How it's the mentality and the mindset that it's okay to move these things and it's okay to have access to them when you're, when you're no longer in government. Had I taken documents when I was in the CIA and if they were in my garage, 
in San Antonio, or if I had him in a hotel uh, somewhere when I'm traveling, guess what? We wouldn't be talking here because I'd be thrown, I'd be thrown in jail. And this is one of those issues where um, folks were criticizing, those that, that were criticizing Donald Trump for doing this should also uh, criticize President Biden. And those that are now criticizing President Biden and weren't criticizing President Trump, uh, that lack of ideological consistency is what ultimately frustrates a, 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 lot of, a lot of voters and a lot of people in the country. This is a serious problem. We should be protecting the secrets of our country. We should not be having them in your office or your hotel room, period, full stop. And I think this is a broader issue that DOJ, Department of Justice, should look into, is how is this happening under two different times, under two different administrations, um, and it's a problem. I want to talk about cybersecurity quickly. How concerned are you still about cybersecurity? It's kind of been pushed to the back with all these other issues we've seen recently. Two years ago, $4.5 billion was stolen in cybercrime. Two years from now, that number is going to be north of $10 trillion. That's with the T. The, the, the more that we're, our society is being interconnected, the more that our digital lives are, are becoming um, as important as our, our physical lives, um, the surface area of attack is increasing. But here is still the good thing. If you do some of the basics, have a strong password. Patch your software, make sure your software on your computer and your phone's up to date, and make sure you're backing up your information, and then you're gonna be, be okay. And also, don't click on things, on emails or texts from people you don't know. If you didn't buy that thing at Kohl's, guess what, it's probably a phishing, it's yeah. probably a phishing exercise. Don't hit the link. Don't hit the link. What's next for Wilbur Will Heard? Well, look, I'm, will I'm be heard, which yeah. is your your website will be heard. Absolutely. Look, I, I'm enjoying my, my role now working with technology companies. I'm on the board of OpenAI. Everybody's talking about chat GPT uh, being involved in, in how these technology works. But uh, the question becomes, is my political career over? Probably not. And I have to evaluate the other ways for me to help my country. Send it a possibility. Uh, every, everything's possible. Run for president. Um, every, everything is possible. And if I can serve, and, and like I'm excited, I've, I've had the opportunity to serve my country in a different ways. And if I can do it again, then I'll evaluate it. I've truly appreciated our conversations over the years, and uh, hopefully this isn't the last one. <laughs> I'm sure it won't be. All right, Will, thanks for your time. And by the way, congratulations. You I, just got married. New Year's Eve. I, yeah. I appreciate KSAT being part of your honeymoon tour here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Three-time Congressman Will Hurd, graduate of Marshall High School here in San Antonio as well, and A&M. Appreciate your time. Thanks, buddy. We'll be right back.